being here. And uh, I'm really, uh, I'm Simon Rosenberg from NBN, and I'm very uh, honored to be able to introduce uh, Devin today. Uh, you know, this, this was uh, hastily thrown together, uh, and uh, we got a call from a mutual friend of ours at the end of last week and, and uh, asked if we could post Devin. And, and I think we were excited to do it because he's, you know, as a long-time entrepreneur and somebody who's built uh, telecommunications and cable businesses and all sorts of other businesses in Europe, and acted uh, in also some NGO, uh, ways of NGOs and some private consulting to foreign governments and so on, he has really thrust himself into the very important and critical debate about the future of Europe. He's one of the leaders of the Irish No campaign, which is now gotten lots of attention and made those of you who've been wrong as closely saw that President Sarkozy this week uh, said that there's going to be a second Irish uh, vote and we know that we'll have something to say about that today uh, in, in a minute. Um, but also that, um, you know, that his institute, the Libertas Institute, is now talking about taking the principles that we're going to hear more about today and really trying to create what may be the first pan European uh, political party. Uh, and so what we have is we have a young, dynamic, uh, remarkable man who's really making his mark and really trying to create a, what is an important and spirited debate about the future of the EU and the future of Europe. And I think we're just honored to have him here with us today and we're anxious to hear from him. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you to, uh, to Simon for those kind words. Um, and thank you to the NDN for hosting uh, this, uh, this get together. Um, NDN is a, a, a new and exciting um, center in, in New, so you can move the first end. And uh, it's a great network across this, this, this great nation, uh, championing progressive ideas and a vision, a new vision for America. Um, and uh, I congratulate you on the great work that we do here. Um, one of the inspiring things about uh, America and, and about what you do here is that democracy uh, is so much at the core of everything that uh, one of the, uh, the interesting and, and, and admirable traits of this country is that uh, however off track it may tack for a while, however it may head slightly in the wrong direction from time to time, it has this great self-correcting ability. And I think if there is a secret to America's success, it is the ability to self-correct. But yes, like every nation, it can, make it, it can make its mistakes and it can go slightly wrong here or there, but it can always tack back. And, and, and the mechanism is democracy, real democracy, accountability to the citizens, and the fact that people have to present themselves before the citizens of the United States every once in a while and ask them for a vote. It's an old-fashioned idea now, but it works, I like it, and I wouldn't see any, re any, any reason to, to change at least that principle, the principle of democracy. And it's something that I witnessed as a, a very young man, I'll be 40 in another week on the 23rd of July, but uh, in my young days, in, uh, in going to the, the then Soviet Union, uh, at the end of the 80s and in the early 90s, I spent a lot of time in Latvia, a little bit of time in Lithuania and Estonia, but a lot of time in Latvia, where I knew uh, members of the Latvian Popular Front, which was their independence movement, and these were the people that managed to break away from the Union of the Soviet Union in August of 1991 when they declared independence. And I saw young, idealistic, progressive, principled people with huge amounts of energy and maybe even a healthy degree of naivete. They didn't know what they couldn't achieve by aspiring to freedom and by aspiring to set up a real democratic system of government where their citizens would be able to hold accountable at ballot boxes people that made decisions for them. And that affected me and it affected me deeply because I saw the Soviet Union in its dying days and what unaccountable, arrogant government can do in the wrong hands. It can rob a nation of its soul, 
of its sense of being, of any vision, and replace it with, at best, mediocrity, at worst, lies. And that's what the dying days of the Soviet Union, that's what I witnessed there. And I witnessed young, principled people stand up to that and succeed. One of the first uh, Prime, Ministers, Prime Ministers of Estonia uh, was 26 years old. Only somebody that young and that principled would dare to have taken a job like that. Because you know what, I don't think you realise the risks that were involved. But they made it work. And that was inspiring. And that stayed with me through my career, which has been primarily in the telecommunications business in Europe. And in 2004, Ireland had the great honour of holding the rotating presidency of the European Union. And I think we did a very good job of it. Uh, uh, the Irish government did a good job of it at the time. Um, and while that was happening, I took it on myself to organise something called the Forum to Debate the Constitution for Europe. And the Irish government very kindly got involved and sent our Minister for European Affairs. And we had the participation of 16 universities. And Al Gore came over as a guest. And, talked about the constitutional process in the United States and gave a very enlightening uh, speech at, at that event. And that was part of the process to bring focus on something called the European Constitution, which at that time was being drafted and prepared, um, in fact it had at that point been produced by the Brazilian uh, that was chaired by Valerie Giscard d'Estaing, the former president of France, which wrote the European Constitution. And in 2005, that document was put to the people of France and the Netherlands in a referendum. And nine days before the uh, referendum vote in France, every home in France received a copy of the Constitution. Jacques Chirac had it sent out the mail out. And uh, it hit every doorstep with a thud. It's a very big document. <laughs> and, in surveys afterwards, actually a large number of people read at least some of the documents. And I have always said that if you read at least some of the European Constitution that was drafted, you would vote no if you were a Democrat, if you believed in democracy and accountability. The Dutch people a few days later voted no. So now we have tens of millions of my fellow European citizens who, in, a, in their majority, a significant majority, voted no. So what happened in Brussels? Because remember, these people in Brussels never present themselves to a ballot box to anybody. They never have to ask for a vote. What did they do? They looked at the result, and they immediately started to delegitimize it, or try to. We've seen the same thing happen now in Ireland. Well, actually, they didn't vote on the uh, Lisbon Treaty. They voted on the price of apples, or the weather, or you know, all of these excuses are trotted out. The Irish government's about to spend half a million euro to study why the Irish people voted no. Let me save them the money. They voted no because they didn't want the Lisbon Treaty. That's why they voted no. But this is the effort which we see once again for the third time to rewrite history to try and talk about a Europe that does not aspire to, de to democratic accountability, that does not have the audacity of hope for accountable and responsible and transparent government. No, they don't want to be accountable. They do not want the inconvenience of having to explain themselves and seek mandates from the citizens. Because here's another really good idea about democracy. The fact that power is vested in the people, in the citizens. You've written it in one of your documents here. You've written it a couple of hundred years ago. Power is vested in the people. And it is devolved, it is lent, on the condition that it is used wisely, to elected officials. And if they use it wisely, they come back and they ask you for a vote again. And if it's not used wisely, you can vote them out. And some of you have done here from time to time, but actually on a fairly regular basis. And the French and Dutch 
decisions. Were they respected? Absolutely not. They went back to Brussels, the lawyers got to work, and they worked their way around. They said, right, we, we preserved, clearly, they wanted to preserve the, the Constitution, but just avoid the necessity of having to have another referendum in France or in the Netherlands. So they removed some very superficial uh, facts, but even our former Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern, um, and our Minister for European Affairs, uh, Dick Roach in Ireland, confirmed that the Lisbon Treaty was 90% or more the same as the European Constitution. Let me tell you how much the same it, it, it was. The typos in the document were the same. Because I read both. The typos were even the same. That's how much the same it was. So they just, they managed to work their way around having to go back and have a referendum and avoided the necessity of having to ask the people. They deliberately disrespected the democratic choice of the people of France and of the Netherlands in a very audacious way. The only constitution, the only nation that they couldn't get their way around was Ireland. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. There were some court judgments, but of course all of them were based on a constitution that was written <coughs> by some very smart people who knew about disputes over treaties. Because we had a civil war in Ireland over the signing of the treaty early in the last century. And our political establishment was born in the conflict of that civil war, and in fact the two major parties still derive themselves from that identity from a fight over a treaty that one side agreed with and the other didn't. So we know how important treaties can be. And having read this document and studied it and seen that it was not just undemocratic but it was anti-democratic, I and others decided to set up Libertas as a campaigning organisation at home, knowing that we were taking on the establishment. Every major political party in the country, the establishment media, everybody, knowing that they were going to come after me and that they were going to pour fire and scorn on us. We were taking on the Brussels establishment, 27 governments and my own government and major opposition party and those people that are familiar with them. But sometimes you've got to do the right thing. I've got four young children. I want them to grow up in an island, in a Europe, that is a place that is capable of leading the world to a place worth going to. Yes, I have the audacity to believe that Europe can go through a renaissance and is capable of having the confidence, the strength and the unity to once again lead the world or at least help lead it in a responsible way. I believe that. Call me naive, call me an idealist, fine. That's the audacity of hope. I think we can do better. I know we can. And when I read this document of almost 400 pages, and then all of the addendums that added up to thousands of pages, you know what? It's an insult to European citizens. It's an insult to the fact that tens of millions of my fellow citizens who said no to this anti-democratic formula are being ignored. And now we have the President of France apparently a couple of days ago saying the Irish people will have to vote again. This is the fellow who in his presidential election campaign promised that he would, instead of uh, a, a, a constitution, he would deliver the French people a mini-treaty. Instead, what we got was almost 8,000 words longer than the European constitution. So what did they do? They reduced the font size and closed the, closed the <laughs> space spacing and, and made it 60 pages shorter. Voila, a mini-treaty. How cynical is this? How stupid do they think the Irish people are? I was doing a media interview just before I came in here with a paper at home. I think the next thing that Libertas is going to do is produce t-shirts, just really simple t-shirts saying, 
It's about democracy, stupid. <laughs> so people finally get the message in Brussels that this isn't a vote against Europe. It's a vote for Europe. What is Europe? Is it a small cabal of elite, unaccountable bureaucrats in Brussels? Or is it almost half a billion people? The Europe that I know and love is almost half a billion citizens. That's Europe. And if the European Union is going to succeed, and it has to succeed, it absolutely has to, it will only succeed if it draws its legitimacy and its energy from those hundreds of millions of European citizens. Because, guess what? They're not going to be dragged backwards without knowing where they're going by a bunch of people who never have to ask them for a vote. It's not going to work. That formula will guarantee failure. There was something called Article 50 in the Lisbon Treaty. And for the first time, it clearly stated that, met how and, and, and that a member state could withdraw from the European Union. Had the Lisbon Treaty been approved, it would have exacerbated this lack of accountability and made it very clear that the European institutions were not just undemocratic, that they were anti-democratic, that they did not want to listen to citizens. And parties on the national level would have ended up running campaigns to withdraw from the Union. The dismemberment, the recipe for the dismemberment of the European Union was in this treaty. And now that we have voted no to this anti-democratic formula, we signed the death warrant on Euroscepticism. And I said this a few days ago and I said it again because it wasn't widely reported because some people don't want to hear this message. But I led the No Campaign in Ireland. And I can tell you, having spoken to the Irish people and spoken to people right across Europe, including in the UK, that Euroscepticism is dead. People realise that the only viable future for Europe citizens is in a union, but a union that responds to the needs and aspirations of its citizens, not of an unaccountable elite in Brussels. That's how we get credibility, that's where we will get legitimacy. And what we have in Europe today when you see somebody like Sarkozy saying the Irish will have to vote again, or you see the things that the German foreign minister said, criticising us and saying we should leave the European Union. It's not his European Union, it's my European Union. It's every European citizen's union. It belongs to us, not to them. Sarkozy says we need to have a vote again, which is a ridiculous proposition because we voted in huge numbers. We voted no to this. The majority the big majority of voters said no to this on a very high turnout in an Irish referendum. And he's telling us we have to vote again. Well, if we have to vote again, then so does France. Then the citizens of France, whose last no vote on this same formula was ignored, they need to have another vote. So do the citizens of the Netherlands. And you know what? So do all of European Europe citizens. Because Europe needs a constitution. And the tip that I would give, maybe it's naive in the way that the Latvians were naive in thinking that they could get independence from the Soviet Union. Maybe this is naive. But a tip that I would give those, thinking about the kind of constitution that Europe needs, is how about making it something that people can read? Making it legible. Making it something that people can understand. How about instead of 400 odd pages, making it 20 pages or 25 pages? Maybe we could even start with something like, we the people. Maybe we could, but that's not what they want. Because it's not about we the people, it's about them the elite. A 25 page constitution that could be put to all of the citizens of Europe for a vote, that up front sets out the aspirations of the European Union, that doesn't try to hide things, I believe is something that the citizens of Europe can buy into and support. I think the citizens of Europe will respond very well to vision, to some ideals being set down, to some objectives being laid out, instead of thinking and knowing that there is some hidden agenda. And this isn't a conspiracy theory. Giscard d'Estaing boasted to Le Monde last summer 
when he didn't realise that Ireland was going to have to have a referendum, he said with regard to the Lisbon Treaty, public opinion will be led to adopt, without knowing it, the policies we would never dare present to them directly. All of the earlier proposals will be in the new text, Lisbon, but will be hidden or disguised in some way. Does that sound like a Democrat to you? It doesn't to me. The Belgian uh, foreign minister, I think it was, said about the Lisbon Treaty, this is unreadable, it is a success. It's sad, and it's very sad, that the word, the phrase, European leadership, is an oxymoron today, when you think about it. In so many respects, that we have a mediocrity in Europe, a mediocrity that is fearful or con even contemptuous of its need to draw its legitimacy from the citizens of Europe. And that has to change. Because we don't want Euroscepticism to rise, to, to rise from the grave that we've put it into. And if they try to dig up the Lisbon Treaty from the grave that we've just put it into, your scepticism will arise with it. And I don't know how we're going to put it back in its box. We mustn't do that. Simon mentioned uh, uh, Libertas as a possible pan European political party. And how does this, what's this, this, this concept, where does this idea, suggestion come from? When you see what Ireland did, with a big majority of voting no, and when you look at the numbers across Europe, and you gauge public opinion, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy himself a few months ago said uh, if there was a referendum in France, the people would vote no. Then why is he telling us we need to vote again? We just uh, did what his, people, his own people would do. Who, who does he work for? That's what he said. If there was a referendum in France, the people would vote no. Let me tell you, if there was a referendum in Germany, Austria, Italy, the Czech Republic, Poland, Sweden, Netherlands, Denmark, so on and so forth, the UK, there would be a no to the Lisbon Treaty. So why are they trying to foist something on the people of Europe that they don't want? It's, uh, is, that, is that democratic? Does that sound like a democratic thing to you? It doesn't to me. So how do we harness what Libertas has done in Ireland, and how do we harness that to turn the tables on this Brussels elite? Because perhaps, perhaps, the way to deal with this is rather than listen to Mr. Sarkozy telling us that we have to have a, ref a second referendum, because obviously it now seems that you can only give one answer in referendum. If we have to have a second, ref second referendum, wouldn't it be interesting to say, well, you know what, you don't want to give your citizens a referendum, so we will. So how do you give a sitting government a referendum that it doesn't want on a European issue? The European elections are in June of next year, 2009. If you look at the turnout figures for European elections, they are very low in all member states or even low in places where you legally have to vote. Low turnout. Ask people, the average person, person, what are the issues that people vote on in a European election? Are they European issues? No. Most people don't vote because they don't know what it's about, or they're just voting for their, their regular party loyalty. Ask people in most member states to name their member of the European Parliament, and they can't do it. They don't know who they So there is a mechanism and an interesting opportunity to give all of the citizens of Europe, in all 27 member states, a referendum. Where, if the message can be delivered to them, they get their opportunity to vote for candidates who commit that if they are voted for, that they will act in you, if you like, as a proxy vote, it becomes a proxy referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. If you want to vote no 
to the Lisbon Treaty, vote for, example, Libertas candidate number one, two, three, or four. That's a possibility. It may be a way to turn the tables on this Brussels elite and redefine the debate space. Because at the very minimum, it's going to force people to talk about what's in the Lisbon Treaty and get them to think about the effects that it's going to have on them. Maybe some people might even read it. Maybe people that are saying that it is absolutely necessary, like Mike Keisha, my Prime Minister, like Ireland's European Commissioner, and you can be sure, all of their colleagues across Europe, they Brian Cowan and Charlie McCready were honest enough to admit that they hadn't read it, or they hadn't read it all. They were honest. I wonder how many of Europe's leaders have actually read the Lisbon Treaty that they are shoving down the throats of their citizens. Very few, I imagine. I imagine the founders of this country read every document that they put their signature to and thought very hard about it. And I imagine that if the American people were asked to vote on a new constitution. They want to know what was in it and they probably read it. And that might be a good idea why to the European people, let's set out a 20 or 25 page constitution that can set out vision, that can set out a roadmap for the future, and that has the audacity of hope for a Europe that's capable of leading the world to a place worth going to. And now I'll take any questions.
vote to Lisbon was a yes to something better and to a better Europe. And to my internal evidence and foreign relations committee, it's very interesting to get your perspective. We're fortunate in Washington to have John Bruton here as well. So yes. you the Irish on both sides of this issue. Um, and, and some of the points that he made, I saw him last week, and he made a couple of interesting points, many of which were not dissimilar from what you were saying. He was saying, for example, that he thought it would be very useful to have a president of Europe that was popularly elected, and a number of other initiatives of that sort, which would introduce uh, an element of greater electoral dynamism into the European Union process. What's fascinating to me, though, in the Irish case, and about the no initiative, is that Ireland has done extraordinarily well yes. under the European Union. You have to look very hard to find another country that has done as well under the European Union. And so within that context, I and I think many people in, in the United States would be sympathetic to some of the concerns about the uh, lack of transparency, the lack of trans uh, accountability that exists in the European Union. And yet, they seem to have been quite successful in bringing a degree of peace, prosperity, and stability that's almost unprecedented in the continent's history. So what, what type of principles would you put forward that differ from what the European Union has accomplished? And in a positive sense, if you were to write up that 25 page draft that you, that you spoke about, what would be substantively different? I imagine you could be more concise in your phrasing, but what would be substantively different from what the European Union what would be substantively different is that the people exercising power and making laws uh, would be democratically accountable at ballot box. That if Europe is to have a president uh, and is to have a foreign and security minister responsible for the foreign security and defense policy as set out in the Lisbon Treaty, those people need to be accountable to the citizens that they are representing. If Europe is going to have a president sitting at the, traveling the world representing me as a European citizen, I'd like them to have to present me with a manifesto, with an idea, a run for elections, so that I can vote for or against them, and every European citizen, citizen should have. So these are really basic things, and that's, you know, the t-shirt it's about democracy. That, that's it, democracy, democratic accountability, that's, that's the issue. Um, to uh, your point about uh, peace, unprecedented peace in the European Union. I would say that even the most uh, ardent Eurosceptic would have to admit that the European process, as we often call it, the European Union, has been the most successful peace process in the history of the world. We said this right throughout the campaign. It has. And, but I think you can know that it's done much more than that. I mean, I am able to live in Ireland. So, you know, and conduct, I do business in the United States of America. I do business with the US government state and local governments. To think that I could have done that from Ireland, uh, that my parents could ever have done that? No. I speak with a, an English accent because my family story is the story of economic emigration from the west of Ireland. My grandmother picked potatoes in Scotland and lived in something called a bothy in a communal living uh, place as a farm labourer. She was a maid in London at the beginning of the Second World War moved back to Apple Island from the west of Ireland. That's what I come from. That's the island I come from. Rank poverty, desperation, oppression. And the European Union, and our own hard work and ingenuity, by the way, has got us to where we are today. And it is in recognition of that fact, of how Europe has been so good for us, and you know, with a bit of, I remember having to get up early for work myself, so they didn't do it all for us. Um, and so did everybody else in Ireland. You know, go onto the streets of Dublin at six o'clock in the morning and look at the traffic. Um, the, but the fact is, is that Europe has been great for us, and it is through a very mature, pro-European reflection. Polls after the, uh, the, the results show eighty-five percent. I think the second highest in Europe favorability their favourable disposition towards the European Union. It was a very mature, reflective vote. If you see a member of your family making a huge mistake, going awry, and you're responsible, and you're mature, and you care about that, you're going to say stop. 
Don't do that. Even if they attack you. Even if they criticise you. And that's what the Irish people did. They didn't do it in any sort of little island or Eurosceptic, you know, unhitches from Europe sort of way. They did it in very mature, careful reflection. When people say people both didn't know what was in the Lisbon Treaty, they knew that they weren't supposed to know what was in it. Jean-Luc Dehan went into the Constitutional Affairs Committee of the European Parliament uh, a few weeks before the vote and said that he did not want to publish or release his plan for the implementation of the Lisbon Treaty and the reason he gave was we do not want to give these arguments to the Irish no side. He didn't want us to have a properly informed debate in Ireland. People knew that. We were pointing it out. Does that answer your question? I think you might just answer my question, but I'll ask you. Um, first of all, from Verizon Communications, I'm very curious about your regulatory affairs. From Verizon? Verizon. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. I think I've been going to tell the communication. I'm sure you uh, have experienced that uh, one of the more difficult parts of Verizon Communications and European Communications um, is that the European Union is not fully a single market.
Um, we were called liars every day, as we would expect the opposition to do to us. Um, but people could see it for what it was. The only uh, entity, the only group handing out copies of the contracts that the Irish people, the Irish people were being asked to sign, the Lisbon Treaty, was us. We were handing out copies of it to people on the streets of Ireland. That was the contract they were being asked to sign. Nobody else sent it to them. <coughs> we, we wanted people to read it, or at least read some of it. I mean, how more truthful and open and honest can you be than that? So that's that's why. It, and, and the other, I suppose, <coughs> the other reason was we started off, we were very, very small when we started off. Because it, we set the task up as a think tank to focus on bringing democracy, greater democracy, accountability, and transparency to European governments. And then we saw what you recognised, which was this is just groundswell of, of support and volunteers. We were printing t shirts and getting, t we ran out of hats, pens, stuff like that. We had volunteers, I mean, in Sligo, which isn't the biggest city in Ireland uh, by any means. Great, great, vibrant place. We had over 40 volunteers out walking the streets. You can see on blog postings where the only people that knocked on doors in many places in Ireland were liver tax volunteers. These people, they weren't paying anything, they didn't even get a cup of tea. It's hard to get out anything in Ireland without a cup of tea. <laughs> they didn't even get a cup of tea. And they were out there knocking on doors at you know, 10 o'clock at night asking people. So, what are the simple positive planks in the liver task version of the European Constitution? What are the simple ideas that lift you over the Eurosceptics and, and get the European project moving again in the kind of inspirational direction? Engage the citizens, draw your energy from them, and the way that you do that is you put a pen in their hands and a ballot paper in front of them and you have them vote for the people that are running the European. You know, it's not, maybe it's not an inspirational idea. It might sound kind of really simple, because it is. We've got to get back to that. Fundamental principles of democracy. That's the big idea. Now, in terms of regulatory situations, um, how Europe should project itself in the world, should it project itself in the world, what are the principles and the values that it should stand for, I would say, first and foremost, democracy. Accountability, freedom, the real meanings of those words, not the, the trumped up or manipulated meanings, the real, the real principles behind what those words mean. The types of ideas that advise and inspire people on this continent to take extraordinary risk. You know, it's, it's interesting. Right? I haven't spent that much time in Washington, D.C., but I've already made five or now I think six trips to Mount Vernon. It's really, it's quite, it's quite an education to go out there and see what, where these people came from that, that, that had the audacity of heart to think that people could have self-determination, didn't, could throw off the shackles of our account and you know what? Those are great ideas. Those are great ideas now and great ideas today. That's what will, it, will, will if you like, inform uh, what Libertas stands for is about. And anything derived from that, from democratic accountability, that's something that, and I hope what happens, by the way, in Europe, is that perhaps through something like this happening, is that we will catalyze the formation of a European policy, a real one. Because it's very necessary that we bring focus and shed a, a penetrating light onto the institutions of the European Union and European governments so that people can see what's going on. The amount of corruption there can just blow your mind. It's amazing what's going on there. It's not being talked about. It is from time to time, but it's not really being focused on. Let's shed that light in there. Let's force the debate. Because if we're out there championing a pan-European position and argument, others are going to have to come out and respond to that on the same battlefield. 
And if that's the only thing that we do, that will be a great achievement. Hi, I'm, I'm an Irish citizen, and I was just wondering um, what your opinion would be if there were to be a second election, would you be completely confident that the no vote would win a landslide victory as opposed to a 3%? Yes. And, do you and, and, and why? <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, look, I mean, I know the Irish government, I know there's someone from the Irish Embassy here today, and I know that they must have been spinning when Sarkozy came out and said that we had to vote again in the way that he did. I mean, and this is the thing, and I say this to my friends, my, my, some great friends that I have in the Irish government, I've been very, very close to them, very close to them. I was a very active supporter of the main government party for years. I was on the futures group of the the, uh, the, 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 the Information Society Commission, uh, very, very involved. I, you know, I love my country, I'm a proud Irishman. And, you know, maybe even some people in Leicester House, I know they were even before this vote, maybe they have been given pause to think when they hear Sarkozy say, you're going to have to vote again. We don't respond well to that in Ireland. If you polled today, if that's just absolutely the way to guarantee an 85% no vote in Ireland. It's going to take them months to dilute down and shed off that statement and try and get people to forget about it. Months. And you can be sure that in another next two or three weeks there'll be another thing. And another thing. And the reason for it is that it's not that people are trying to sabotage. I mean, these are people that want a yes vote. But they are showing in a very open way, exactly the traits that we say are the problem. And I'm saying, no more of this, thank you very much. It, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Just really, I noticed the seat of the class is being very progressive in the European Party. Do you not have any worries your party will not resuscitate your skepticism? And that a lot of the people working for you will indeed be your skeptics and not be your progressives? Do I worry about it? Uh, no. I would say, and I've sat down with people who, um, who would have been more Eurosceptic than, than anything else up to now. Um, even some what would have been viewed as Eurosceptic media in the past have sat down and you go through this as you would. And yeah, some Euroscepticism is just really dumb. Okay? It's the, we can't go back there again. Some of it is very honest, insofar as that it is Eurosceptic because it is sceptical, or has been sceptical, of these problems that I pointed out. If you shed that penetrating light on the institutions, if these individuals are accountable in the ballot box, those Eurosceptics, what I would call the mild Eurosceptics, can be brought over to become progressive in their view of the future of Europe. And the fact is, is that today, through experience, most Europeans, as you have made the point, you know, we all recognise this has been a really good thing. So, I mean, Eurosceptics are in the minority anyway, and they're going to be in an ineffective minority, uh, I think, henceforth, unless the Lisbon Treaty is revived. That will be the oxygen um, and, and, and the transfusion that they need to get back to life. Because otherwise, a state has been driven through old-fashioned Euroscepticism by setting this living treaty uh, into the road of the Britain. Kevin, thank you. I hope you have a few minutes maybe to stick around to go to the studio. Thank you very much.